Welcome back to Point Counterpoint for this edition, which is a part two to our last Point Counterpoint that was called The Dangers of Christian Music, part one. Music and worship are not the same thing. And I'm very blessed today not to try to accomplish this task of sharing so much content by myself. So I want to welcome in my brothers in the Lord, my partners on the podcast and on the Dr. Forensics team. I'll start in the amazing state of Minnesota because he makes the state amazing. Brother Kyle Fosberg, how are you, brother? Well, I'm doing quite well up here despite the horrendous weather. The horrendous winter weather. I hate winter, guys. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and you are allowed to hate it. That is perfectly okay. It doesn't mean that you hate God. You just hate the weather. We get you. Well, the thing, the thing is, Sean, I'm going I'm to be honest. Let's make it biblical here. So I have to hate it because being the carnal person that I am, if we didn't hate winter, we wouldn't appreciate the spring. And so it keeps you grounded. It's God's way of yes. keeping you grounded. So I have to suffer through it, and um, that's just – I grew up with it. I, we just learned to accept it. But, man, I got I to gotta get that one off my chest. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. And the good news is the next season that's around the corner, it's spring, and it's coming. So your day is coming, my friend. Just endure it a little while longer. And let's shift to the East Coast in the beautiful state of North Carolina – our resident pastor on the call, the one, the only, Pastor Kenny Graves. Pastor Graves, how are you doing today? I am good, brothers. I am doing awesome. Uh, again, thank you for having me be a part of this. It's, uh, I'm just um, ecstatic about this conversation. So let's it's dig in. Fantastic. fantastic. Now, before we get going here, too, one thing I'm going to tell the audience is that uh, Pastor Graves does do a Facebook Live service, and we're going to put the link to that eventually in our show notes, uh, Pastor Kenny. I think it would be great for people who may be like most of us. We don't have a congregation, but we're looking to get good biblical content, and I have been on your Facebook live teachings, um, and there's more coming down, so we will give our audience a chance to, to get to know uh, the Lord better through your ministry. So I will be Amen. circling back with you on that, my friend, okay? Amen. Yes, sir. All, all righty then. Well, let's go, guys. So last time we left off, there were kind of three pervading thoughts that uh, we accomplished. There were more, quite a bit. Um, but I will say it's been refreshing to have this conversation with both of you because you're musicians and you bring so much depth to the matter and both of you are so passionate because this is not something that you get to talk about. This is something that you guys both lived, both from a church perspective and both from a secular perspective. But we established in the last podcast that music is spiritual. And so the first stop on our train is let's make sure people understand that because it is spiritual. And I'll cite what the Bible says. And it says it about our Lord. Everything was made by him, everything was made for him, and without him, nothing exists. And the music that we're able to play and the instruments that we use to play and the words that we sing, none of that comes about without the Lord. So it leads you to ask the question is, should I always make sure that songs that I call worship, should they edify and uplift and glorify God? And I can get a resounding amen and yes to that because it should be. Now, that might sound a little dogmatic. I mean, of course, we have people that play music that is good for the ears, good for happy times, times of, celebrate, times of celebration. I'm not saying that we don't ever have music. But when it comes to us using music as believers, we should actually understand, as we establish, that the Word of God and music should work in tandem. And music should always be supporting and propping up the preaching of the gospel, not vice versa. And the strength of music should be the same strength found in solid theological uh, Bible exegesis. And hopefully 
the pastor is going to do the same by preaching of the word and making the word a priority. So I'm going to yield to you, Pastor Kenny, every Sunday. You hold the service with the flock that God gives you. What do you say about that, and am I headed in the right direction in my thought process? You, you, you absolutely are. You're definitely headed in the right direction, and not only headed in the right direction, you're, you're spearheading the right direction. Um, because when we, are, and it, when we are talking about God's word and we are preaching God's word and we're teaching God's word, uh, all we are are, again, sinners saved by grace that is teaching about the Holy One and the beauty and the wrath of his holiness. It's all good because it's all God. So pulling ourselves out of the, the, the text of Scripture and reading the text, biblical exegesis of the text, is what's the most important thing because that's what grows us. That's what nurtures us. That's what gives us the knowledge we need to go out here and be, um, you know, sheep in the midst of wolves. And, I, I'm, again, it's, I, I love the topic because I have been duped by music, being a musician. So, Yes, you are definitely headed in the right direction. Well, as a a point of recall, the first time I sat in on your Facebook Live church, uh, your wife sang. And obviously I wasn't listening for critique. I wasn't listening for content purposes. But the one thing I do remember, and, and this is a compliment to where the Lord is doing in your congregation, is that she sang a cappella and that the words she sang were biblically solid, and they actually led people into the preaching of the word. I remember, Pastor Kenny, how what your wife sang right there live on camera supported the teaching and the preaching that followed for you. And that was a good experience for me because coming up through uh, Southern Baptist churches and Church of God in Christ and – non-denominational churches, and then the circus churches, which is all the mega churches. <laughs> and you can get a real rock and roll concert at those churches. <laughs> I've been through a lot of musical ups and downs, and most of them have been vacuous, except I'll go back to when I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church because that was the only place in my, my life where we actually used and read from hymn books. And so, so much what I learned about the Lord was because of the teaching of, you know, Pastor Carr, and what we read and sung from those hymn books because most of those songs, not all of them, but most of them, probably a good 90% of them did support the biblical narrative. You know, Um, you start singing, you know, about the blood of Jesus, and you start singing about God's holiness, and you start singing Amazing Grace, but not singing Amazing Grace from a self-centered point of view, focusing on how amazing it is that God had decided that he would send his son to die on the cross for our sins, that's what makes the song amazing because none of us actually deserve to have our sins forgiven. So God did us a huge favor and rescued us. But I say that to say it's important that we either remind people or we tell them that what they're consuming could possibly be keeping them from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And I mentioned in the last call that Satan does use spiritual music to keep people from the gospel because it sounds spiritual, but it's incomplete in terms of what the message is. And that's why we have so many immature Christians because they've leaned, they've leaned they, they were leaning on music, which has become a hook. It brings them in, but it also does not help them to grow. It just keeps them captive. And that is a huge sore spot. So before I turn to Kyle, I'll just make one last note. Over the last week, since we did the last podcast, I spent some time watching uh, TV, uh, opposition research. Part of my job is I get to watch terrible Christian programming, which I, which I hate doing, but I have to do it so I'll know what's going on, so I'll know how to share and so I got to watch the Demonic Hillsong channel, and, and right on cue, Hillsong, in some auditorium, 30-minute concert, dark, dank, sexy worship, words on a big screen, lights, flashy things, people crying, hands in the air, and every lyric that came across that screen 
did not support the biblical narrative. It was a spiritual song that actually created the false sense of a spiritual or a true worship experience. So if nothing else today, we are going to continue to shoot up that flare so that you will ask yourself the question, and is what I'm consuming benefiting my spiritual growth? And with that, I'll yield to Brother Kyle. Yeah, well, one point I'll just add to what you both addressed is the the conversation point that music should be something that we talk about in the last days here in the church age because I noticed something that's common in the church is for people to want the Bible to explicitly address every question that they have. Now, obviously here at the channel, we say, read or, excuse me, watch and listen to the videos with an open Bible. So we want people to find the truth in God's word. But one thing that we have to understand is that we have the Holy Spirit. And it does a disservice to the Holy Spirit to assume that every single question that we have is going to be easily found in the Bible. You know, the Bible isn't going to address, isn't going to address the modern practice from a medical perspective point of view of abortion. Obviously, it's going to address it from a moral position. And you may have to look and find different areas of scripture to make the best case. It's not always going to be, oh, well, here's the verse that talks about this, and then we're going to find the verse that talks about that issue, and that is like it's just point for point. You can just go in and find all the answers really easy. You have to study it. And so when it comes to music, one thing that we didn't really touch on in the last call was understanding the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, we talk about the book of Psalms. You know, you're going to talk about that a little bit later, Sean, on the call here, but that's the Old Testament. So while we can look at that as a template, uh, we have to understand that that's the Old Testament, and now we have Jesus Christ to sing about. So we have a whole new, I'm not going to say genre, <laughs> I'm going to say topic, I'm going to say point, of we have a, we have the object of worship being Jesus Christ, so the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, he came to fulfill the law. We have that now to sing about. So being that, a lot of the, obviously, a lot of human history has taken place since Pentecost. So we have to continue to facilitate these new songs for this age. So we can, don't always, we can't go back to the Old Testament and draw a straight line all the way to the New Testament. We have to look at Jesus Christ now. And that's why I'm going to say it's a, it's a bit trickier. It's a bit trickier to address the topic of music because you can't go to the Old Testament and find a song about Jesus Christ. Now you can see foreshadowing of certain things, but you, you're not going to be able to see the songs that we can right now having the full revelation of God, having both books as one Bible, one complete Bible, something that didn't exist back then. We now have the privilege and the blessing of that, and so we have to actually live out our faith, and music is just one element of that. But here's, here's I'm going to tie it all together now. When we talk about the Holy Spirit and the role the Holy Spirit has in the church, I think it does a discredit to the Holy Spirit to say, well, we're always going to be going back to the Old Testament to tie up some conclusion that we're making about music in the church age. I mean, the, yes, it obviously has relevance and pertinence because it's the Bible. It's still the same God. But we have a whole new revelation of truth now in Jesus Christ. And so we have all these things that we can sing about that they didn't have the privilege to sing about or write music about back then. So what do we do? Just like when you, me, and whoever else on the team, Kenny, um, if it's another brother or sister on the call, we are having a conversation that the listener, if they have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will confirm within them as being true. You don't even have to see our faces. You don't have That's to correct. know our life story. You don't have to know our background. But they're going to be able to have the, they're going to have the conviction when they hear it, at least that's 
what the purpose of this channel is. That's what we're going for. And so the same thing is true with music. We can't go in there and explain why a particular song is justified biblically. I mean, that would kind of defeat the purpose of music itself because as we talked about in the last call, music is a mysterious thing and none of us really understand it. And that's kind of what makes it great. If you could explain everything and deduce it down to a science, it would be really clinical and it would, you would strip it of its very blessing in a way. So while it's important to reflect on the Bible and it's important to use it as a criteria for your music or your art or whatever it is you're doing, we have to also understand the Holy Spirit's role in this is going to be confirming that as being biblically edifying music to whoever's listening. Or if it's in the case of a concert, whoever's listening and watching. But we definitely hope that there's not too much of a spectacle visually going on because it really should be about God, not us, performing. And it shouldn't be about all the theatrics and all that. That shouldn't be part of it. It should be about the music and it should be about God. It should be glorifying God. It should be edifying the believer. So if it does that, then it doesn't really need to be um, deconstructed down to a science. Just like we don't need to explain why people should have to listen to what we're saying on the call because the Holy Spirit's going to convict them. And then we're at the same time, we're encouraging them to listen with an open Bible. So if we do those things, then the music can take its rightful place. But at the same time, we're not forsaking looking at the Old Testament, looking at the constructs that God has laid in front of us, because those are intentional. We need to study those. But at the same time, we're not forsaking the Holy Spirit either. We're understanding the Holy Spirit is something that we have now that wasn't the blessing that they had back in the Old Testament. So we have the Holy Spirit in the church age. It's a whole different realm, and that's why it's so important to keep the music pure and to keep it godly and to encourage people to study the Bible for themselves and to pray about these things and seek the counsel of God because that's ultimately what we're going to be doing when we get on a call and we're having a discussion, anything. We're always praying about it. We're always meditating on the Word. So let's not forget the Holy Spirit's direct role in all of this. And I yield back to you, Sean. Well, very well said, and I have to piggyback on what you said to the degree as you talked about the relevancy and the template or some of the construct of what the Old Testament provided to us. So as a believer, the only place that we can get a reference or a construct for music is actually from the Old Testament. The problem with that is, is that you have to really dig to get the construct of music, but it's not like the construct that we built here in the, the, in the modern age. Someone on the channel made a great comment, and I didn't really know how to reply to it, but it was worth noting because uh, I appreciate the fact that they made the point, and I'll read the comment. It says, isn't the whole book of Psalms a collection of songs? Are we not to, quote, sing new songs unto the Lord, question mark? And that's a really, really good question. So the commenter goes on to say, how about the musicians just turn around and look up facing the Lord with the people behind them? So that's physical positioning. That's not spiritual positioning. So when you take the construct of the Psalms, now, the Psalms that David sang and the Psalms that Asaph sang, I believe there was probably three or five psalmists that wrote them. They're not all Psalms of David. They positionally were spiritual position songs. They had nothing to do with physical position or people standing behind them. And I had to reply back to that with the only way that I thought that it was fair and generous. And it was that, hey, we hear you. But the question is, is anyone skilled or sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit to even sing a song? to where it blesses the hearer. And the reason why I commented that way, because if I was a skillful writer or a singer, and Kenny's a writer and singer, and you, Kyle, a writer and singer, and if we all chose the same song, we decided we were all going to come up and sing a song from our heart, and we were going to sing Psalms 35, which I love Psalms 35, it would not sound the same. The tone, the melody, the words, 
the, the emphasis of the songs because they're all spiritual expressions. And right. the emphasis of the expressions depends on what that person is going through. So think about how dynamic God made music. We don't understand it. But the, but the record he left us is so dynamic, we can't even understand it. And we don't even know how to properly use it. When's the last time you've gone to a concert and somebody sang for 90 minutes and sang the Psalms? You haven't. Well, maybe you have, but I never have. So I think you make a great point, Kyle. We're not saying that music is not important. We're just saying that the scope and the construct of it is so limited that we should only take our cues and our information from what we know and not basically work outside the parameters of that because, as we see in 2022, people are still making music the thing. We have churches that are built on music. We have people who come to a church edifice because of the music. They're not coming because they want to know about the Lord. They're coming because the hook is the music. And, oh, by the way, we're going to give you a message to make you feel good. Therefore, i.e., we have given you your dopamine, and you will come back next week, and we'll have coffee and donuts. Now, I don't know if they have coffee and donuts at your church, Pastor Kenny. I'm sure you might have some snacks, but that's not bad. And that's not necessarily good, but the point is the dopamine effect of using music to keep people comfortable in their sinful, corrupt state is a tragedy, and the Lord does not take kind to it. And there's going to be a reckoning. I'm not being ugly. I'm just being honest. And with that, I'll yield to you, Pastor Kenny. What I would say is everything that y'all said is spot on. And it, it just reminds me of, and I, I'll fast forward to the New Testament because there's two things I want to I want to say on on what y'all said. The first thing is, Paul tells the Ephesian church, addressing one another in, in Ephesians 5:19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But where is he directing it to? He goes on to say, singing and making melodies to the Lord with your heart. So the, the emphasis is not on us and what we do. The emphasis is on the Lord. So everything is, the, the, as you say, Brother Sean, all the time, center mass is pointing straight back to Christ. But we don't get there until we understand what the prophet Isaiah said in um, Isaiah 64. I'm going back to the Old Testament where he says in Isaiah 64, uh, starting at verse 6, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds, this includes how we worship in music. All our righteous deeds are like polluted, are like a polluted garment. We are all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Now, with all that being said, God is the potter. We are just the clay. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go back to a point you made earlier regarding my, my wife and her singing. This is why we, we, like, drill in and sometimes have to be dogmatic about what the Word of God says. And it's not to hurt anybody. It's to let them know that once you find a more excellent way in the Word of God, talking about Jesus, leading people to Christ. Once you find that more excellent way, I promise you, even music starts to take a back seat because you understand that you're being created in his image and not the image of whatever song that sounds good. And I yield the floor. Well, I'm going to let Kyle slip in here. Yeah, so I want to I want to piggyback on a point that you just made, Kenny, and then bring it back to something Sean said on the last call. And by the way, if you haven't listened to the last call, definitely go listen to that podcast and then listen to this because we're referencing a lot of stuff from that. Uh, But what you said, Kenny, is that music is for the Lord. The Bible says it's for him. And so if you're by yourself, music can be a form of prayer. If you're just sitting in a room playing by yourself, and I use that reference because that's something I've done a lot, (laughs) so I know it very well. It can be a form of meditation and prayer, and it should be enjoyable and beneficial to you yourself because it's honest. If it's truly for the Lord, you should get some satisfaction and 
enjoyment and even edification out of it playing really for and to yourself, really, which is to the Lord. But um, So that's a really key point. Then the other point that Sean made on the last call that I really, really liked, and it, it just struck a chord with me, no pun intended. I really didn't mean that pun, sorry. But <laughs> you said, Sean, that we didn't need any more songs about our sick and sinful condition or something like that. I'm paraphrasing what you said. But Correct. Boy, that is so, so important because one of the problems with contemporary music, not in like the, you know, hip hop, rap, pop culture so much, but in like the more niche avant-garde sort of folk communities, a lot of stuff that came out of the 1960s counterculture movement. One of the real big problems with that music, the folk stuff, uh, was that it's songs about you know, it's it's what they used to call complaining music. You know, it's songs about the the sick, depraved condition, the blues, the, the depravity, the the sadness, the sorrow. And I think there's a place for that, but it has to be reflected against the positivity of Christ. But there's a lot of just music about suffering out there, and that doesn't glorify God in any way. And so, really, you see a distinct line between a lot of what's going on in the secular niche music and what traditionally has been prominent in the music industry uh, and what is truly edifying music. You see a very stark line there. Um, there's no criteria. It doesn't, it's not like you have to mention Jesus a certain amount of times as a song for it to be godly. I mean, that, that's a, a fallacy that we need, to, uh, we need to talk about. There isn't like a, a scientific criteria, a biblical criteria, other than the fact that we have psalms, as we mentioned. But um, you know, it's hard to be extremely dogmatic about what's edifying music because you can have music that's simply instrumental and it can give glory to God. Well, how can you explain that? You know, if you have a melody that is very pleasing and very godly, it's kind of hard to explain why it is. I mean, you could probably get into the music theory and, you know, get technical about it and maybe make some bit of sense about it, but that kind of is a little bit clinical too. You, you want to just be able to appreciate something that's godly for the sake of what it is and not always have to explain it, explain the beauty or the mystery away. So I would just highlight one of the key distinctions that we can make is that the music that we make should be positive. It should be, it should be beautiful. It should be joyful. It should be, I mean, you know, again, you can get scientific about it, but it should always be reflected against if there's, an, if there's something about sin in the song and maybe it's, it's kind of a, a tough truth that's being um, sung in the lyrics, it should always ultimately be about redemption, about joy, about the beauty and the glory of God. And I think if we take that approach, it would be a whole different world musically. But unfortunately, the music industry has been able to as we talked about in the last call, it influenced the church profoundly to the point where the church really is the world. It's become like the world. And there's a lot of money to be made off singing songs that are relevant to people. Well, we live in a very depressing and sinful world. So singing about the glory of God is not going to be relevant to most people. And so where's the money? The money is in the sin. Um, it's very sad to say that, but that's just the truth. So I agree with you, Sean, the point you made in the last call, one of the, the most important points, because that's not something a lot of people have the, the guts to say or the, yeah. the wherewithal, but you said it, and I don't even know if you planned on <laughs> saying that, but I'm just like, all right, yeah, you went there. All right, now, now we can have a real conversation because <laughs> the, the music should be beautiful, you guys. We don't need any more punk rock garbage. I mean, this, that's stuff that people use to exude, I don't know, to, to release angst and all this stuff, that isn't godly. You know, if you it are angry rebellion. or you're frustrated, there are, there are ways the Bible can help you and you can address certain things, but playing music and then disseminating that out, sorrowful music to the world, that's not edifying, that's not helpful, that doesn't make the world a better place. Music should be beautiful. That, that's my, my main point, it should be beautiful, and that's not a philosophy a lot of people share especially not in the secular world, but in the church. Again, it's become so much like the secular world that that's now becoming a, a, a big battle, too, uh, that we have to unfortunately fight. But anyway, I'm going to throw it back to you, Sean. So. Well, thank you. And 
back to coattailing on what you said. You know, so much of our music is born out of the false prosperity gospel. And if you go back 20 years, at least as a minimum, um, we went from theological songs, sounding songs like the old rugged cross, to celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Nothing wrong with the words of that, but that's what's called a 7-Eleven song. You sing seven words through 11 different stanza. And we started calling that worship. That is not worship, nor is it a song that actually glorifies God. If the Psalms are a template and every Psalm tells the story of God and his goodness and his son, and there's really no, there's nothing repetitive about a song. But when we create these modern-day contemporary songs, there's this repetitiveness, and it actually flies in the face of Scripture because we're not to pray vain repetitiously. So guess what? We should probably not sing repetitiously. Now, I do get it. You've got to use a hook or something to move the song along because let me just be ugly here. I don't think most musicians in our century are that talented. I don't think songwriters right. are that talented. I just don't. I'm not a singer, and I don't care if singers email me or comment and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking about because I listen to what y'all write and sing. You're not that talented. 7-Eleven songs are not talented. Nobody at Hillsong is talented. No one is skilled. Excuse me. They're talented, but they're not skilled. And I'll tell you something. Fun fact. Fun fact in the Bible and, boy, I don't know how the Holy Spirit helped me stumble across this, but in the book of Chronicles, you would be lost to probably recognize that even then, when they were dividing and setting up the nation of Israel after all their conquests, that they actually trained 288 musicians. In the book of First Chronicles, chapters 25, I'm going to read this because I'm going to read parts of it because it has a bunch of names that I'm going to butcher, and I don't want to do that. So I'll read, I'll read, and then I'll jump down. So it says, First Chronicle 25, Moreover, David and his commanders of the army set apart for the service of some, the sons of As- Asaph. Hmm, Asaph was a psalmist. Keep, the, keep, that in your, keep that in your hat. Of the He-Man and of Jedithon, who were to prophesy with liars, harps, and cymbals, and the number of those who performed their service was, and I'm jumping down to verse number six, it says, all of these were under the direction of their fathers to sing in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, lyres, and for the service of the house of God, Asaph, Jedithon, and Heman were under the direction of the king. Well, who's the king? David's the king. Verse 7, their number who were trained in singing to the Lord with their relatives who all were skillful was 288. So if you care to know that it is a biblical thing to be trained and to be skillful in singing unto the Lord, there you have it. It's in the Bible. See, one of the things that I'm seeing, maybe you guys see it too, people don't think that there's a precedent in the Word of God, so they just run off and do whatever they want. But if you're serious about saying using your talent and or maybe God did give you a gift, then you would want or desire to be biblical and to be as skillful as possible. And I'll say this, and Pastor Kenny, you can speak to this because you've been here. There is no reason why anybody – who is, quote, unquote, leading song service or a, quote, quote, minister of music, which there's no such thing as the title of a minister of music. They just made that up. <laughs> it's just That's ridiculous. You're minister. I mean, we're ministers of reconciliation. We're not ministers of music. I hate that term, and, and I mean that. I do hate it because it's, it's not effective. A person who's leading in worship, they have an obligation to know the word of God just as much as the pastor in that pulpit. But what do, we, what, what do we do? We let these talented people who fit the culture, who are attractive, who are edgy, get behind or get on the stage because, you know, they have these removable pulpits. So basically, as you said last time, Kyle, this is just a concert venue. And they, quote, unquote, lead worship. And the only scripture they might be able to quote is John 3.16, and they'll butcher that. 
but then they don't know what John 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 says. So it is a responsibility that anybody who's letting anybody lead any type of worship at any level, even in junior church, you better make sure that person reads their Bible and prays, because if not, you are committing malpractice as a pastor. You are actually creating more work for yourself because you're allowing music to contaminate their minds, wreck their theological soundness, and you're going to spend years and months trying to untangle the web because, as I said in the last call, music is a weapon, and Satan will certainly use spiritual music to keep people from hearing the gospel. And I yield to you, Pastor Kenny. A hard word makes a soft heart. A, a hard word makes a soft heart. A soft word makes a hard heart. And this is going back to your point, Brother Sean, with knowing just as much of the Bible as the pastor knows. You should, because we are making disciples, and the word don't change. None of the word in thousands of years has changed. Different interpretation, yeah, because it was written in Greek and Hebrew, and we speak English. So it had to be written in something that we can understand. We read the ESV at, at, at our church. It's a Bible that we can understand. But I, I, I do drill in the words of God are more important. And yes. we can come to church and not play a single instrument and still lead knowing that our hearts are filled. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, now from, uh, so from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Although we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, Now here's the key scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you do not have a pastor that is willing to stick to the word and give you a hard word to soften your heart, to make you struggle with it, again, with these talented musicians, it's hard because now your pastor got to preach the word according to what your praise team is singing. Jolly go happy go lucky, good jolly go happy go lucky. But when you are giving songs like the old hymns or the, or the song you heard my wife sing, it is, according, it is giving praises, giving worship to God. It makes preaching easier because now we can, we can actually practice the ministry of reconciliation, which, like you said, we all have. But it's hard to do that when our music is more lean toward emotional, let me just pump you up full of emotion, Instead of let me, um, let me go with what the Bible says what we are supposed to love the Lord with, with all our heart, with all our soul or mind, and with all our strength. We forget the mind part. It's, it's an intellectual thing, too. Yes, Not it just is. your emotion. Now, is music going to make you emotional? Absolutely. Like Brother Cal said, music is a beautiful thing. But it's not just emotion. Because what are you going to do when you don't have a keyboard, Kenny, to go out there and play? What are you going to do in everyday life when somebody starts getting on your nerves? You still have to address that person that's made in likeness in the image of Christ and song him in spiritual songs, making melody to your heart with the Lord. How do you do that if you do not, as a pastor, give a hard word to be able to soften that heart? And I yield the floor. Absolutely. We are, we're, on, we're all in agreement and in one accord. That doesn't surprise me because I know how passionate we are about the gospel and about it being and having the most preeminent spot. And I want to share something that I think will, might be a little bit of a litmus test for all of those musicians out there and people who call themselves worship leaders, ministers of music, which there is no such thing. But I want to challenge you to go find this particular song on YouTube, The Old Rugged, Rugged Cross. Now, I'm going to read a couple stanzas of this song, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm reading the song 
as I go along. So here's how the song opens. I'm going to read two stanzas of this. It says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. That's a true statement. The emblem of suffering and shame. That's also a true statement. Just like Kyle said, we have the gospel of suffering that's not being taught. Then it says, and I love that old rugged cross where the dearest and best for the world of lost sinners was slain. That is a true statement. So we're only four sentences in, and everything that they said in this song is true. Second stanza. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Now, if you're going to talk about I in the song, let it be that. I'm cherishing what was happened, what happened on the cross. So that is something to be appreciated. Then it says, till my trophies at last I lay down. Those trophies are spiritual works unto the Lord, the things we do that God has called us to do, that we do out of a sincere, sincere heart. And that does not mean working in the church. That means being kind to your wife, your neighbor, not kicking your dog, and being open in the door at the Walmart. Those are those works that we lay down. Last two lines. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Yes, on a daily basis, we need to cling to the cross because we're sinners that are being saved. We're in, the, we're in the process of being saved. We are always at risk every single day from leaving the faith that we once knew, as Paul said. And then the last stanza of the second verse of this song, and exchange it someday for a crown, which is also a true statement. So I read two stanzas of this song, and everything in that song was true. So later today... When you're in your car, you're driving, you're listening to your local contemporary Christian radio station. Ask yourself the question. Two stanzas into that song that you like so much, is what they're saying true? Is it accurate or is it incomplete? That's your litmus test. Because if you're consuming music that leaves you empty or incomplete, it is not supporting your spiritual growth. And I'll yield to you, Brother Kyle. Yeah, well, to build on that, music is really an outpouring. And so one problem that I noticed with people who have music as a profession or a livelihood, to put it that way, um, music becomes an idol and becomes a fixation, and then it loses its value and purpose. And so in the life of the church, you know, we're looking at music as a reflection of God and something that's biblical and that does have biblical standards. Uh, now that can be discussed, that can be debated to a certain extent, but ultimately it should be edifying, it should be beautiful, it should be godly to the things that we discussed. Um, the problem is when we make music an idol, we inherently lose the point of why we're performing or writing the music to begin with. That's why music can never become the idol and still be or still retain its value. It becomes something else. It becomes a fixation instead of a reflection of God. Music is a reflection of God and biblical truth and the beauty of the world that he created and the miracle of life and all these things. It's a reflection of that. So music, for that reason, takes a very small role. And I would say that's my opinion, but I just think that you can be dogmatic about it because if we have music take a very small but necessary and prominent place in our lives, the life of the church, then it can still be critical, but that doesn't mean it has to be frequent. So when the word is emphasized, when the sermon and the reason you assemble as a church, if that's the focus, if that's the criteria, and then the music comes in as a way to support that, that's the proper place for a hymn. Um, but personally, I'll just add this final thought. I don't believe it's a necessarily a good idea. I'm going to put this real nice. Um, to have music after a sermon. 
like, you know, growing up in church, it was always, you know, usually the sermon wasn't really any good, uh, so it didn't, you know, for that reason it was bad, but let's just assume you had a great sermon, a real fiery sermon, and it really was like, like, you know, the air sucked out of the room, everyone's like, oh, you know, and all of a sudden you get, all right, everyone get up and clap your hands. It kind of empties the, you kind of lose that moment, and the last thing in someone's mind as they're walking out it's probably going to be the music. And I'm not saying it can't be a joyful, like, spontaneous thing. If, that, if everyone just spontaneously breaks, into the same, breaks out into the same song, it's probably a God thing. But I, I'm not saying you should quell that. But to have it part of the formula, I don't necessarily think is the best idea. Because if you give a really fiery sermon, man, you want that to be the last thing that they remember when they walk out of there. It should be a very sobering thing. We don't go to church to feel good. Even if the, the truth is spoken, the formula matters. You know, you go to church to, to edify one another and to preach the truth. That's what the point of it is. And so, you know, I mean, you can't be extremely dogmatic about these things because it, a lot of it depends on the nature of, you know, various things. But I'm just saying from my experience, um, I think music takes too prominent of a place. It did in church services that I was a part of. And I think it has a place. It shouldn't be forsaken. I think that's obviously, uh, that is sometimes a mistake that people make, that you're saying, well, it's somehow not as important. No, no, it's important, but it's just not, it doesn't take the same role that we maybe think it should, as prominent of a role. It should take a, a lesser role because it's an accent. Music is an accent to what's going on in the service, the point of the service. And so I'm going to wrap this all the way around to the point that I just started to make at the beginning of my statement, and that is, if music becomes the focus point, if it becomes the idol, you inherently are going to lose the very point of why you're playing the music in a church gathering. You, you can't right. do that. Um, it's, it's dangerous. It's not just like, well, you know, the sermon is maybe going to be a little bit less effective. No, it actually will create an environment that's very ungodly. And that's just, the music is a very powerful thing. And be, like we talked about in the last call, it's, it's mysterious. We don't really understand it. So we should be very careful about how we interpret it, how we see the role of the, church, of the music in the, in the church. These are all very critical things because we're seeing the absolute wreck of the faith now. And we're seeing it happen in these so-called churches where music is prominent. So, okay, there's definitely something to be said about that. I mean, that's kind of proving the point right there. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I don't know if Kenny or Sean or one of you wants to pick up on that, but you take the floor. No, we're, we're definitely in agreement with you, but, and it's all about having a position. And I yield to Pastor Kenny. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for your, your points, all of them. Um, one thing that you said that I, I really do want to um, kind of go back on is making um, music becoming an idol, because I really don't think we understand the seriousness of that statement that you made. We got to understand that music can very, very quickly become an idol, and I'm going to show you how. Like I told you before in the in the last uh, podcast, I've been a musician on the secular side and in the church side. And how when you look at the movement of the people, a lot of times you can't tell the difference from the church to the, the, the club. So when I first started playing, remember I said that, you know, nobody was listening to me, nobody was, you know, really doing anything. And this is how music started to become my idol. As soon as somebody started to move, it don't take but one. As soon as somebody started to nod and bob their head to what I was playing, Okay, now, now at the same time, I'm saying I'm using this for God, but it was, it was a delusion. It was a delusion because the more people started to bob their head, the more I'm like, okay, now I'm the man because people are focusing in on me. Not only the people, the pastor, because the pastor would look over at me and hear, nod his head, smiling. Yeah, I like that. What do you think that's going to do to my ego? That's going to inflate my ego even more. It's going to make Dopamine. me want to play even more. So, exactly, exactly. It's going to inflate it. So I, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, not only do the people nod their head, the pastor's nodding his head. Who else can nod their head? 
So now I'm, I'm, I'm getting too big for the church. I need to go out and start playing in front of other people. Well, if I can slide so, in here, Kenny, I want to say something and let you come, come back yeah, to you because it will be, it'd be pointed. You know, the thing is there are rewards that the musician and the hearer get because of dopamine. I mean, we, we keep talking mm-hmm. about this, and to preface the listeners, I'm trying to work on this exhaustive general video that explains the difference between true worship and then worship that has what's called dopamine rewards. Dopamine rewards, what you just explained, is that you were rewarded because you saw people moving to the music. They were rewarded mm-hmm. because they liked the music that you were playing. Now, that's not necessarily bad. But the whole premise is, what's the intent of it? Exactly. What's the intent of it? Then, of course, when you double down and layer worship with all of these other uh, visual stimulus, like a big screen and words on the channel and B-roll playing and lights and Jesus flashing um, on the screen, what you're doing is, overwhelming people from a sensual standpoint. So at that point, it doesn't matter what you say. You can actually sing the old rugged cross and provide so many stimuli, visual stimuli, audible stimuli, they never hear the message. They get overwhelmed with the stimuli, and that's what happens Sunday in and Sunday out with all of these so-called worship bands and worship leaders and these worship experience. I'm like, what in the world is that? I mean, I don't get it. I'm an old school guy, but there's no such thing as a worship experience. The only thing you experience in worship is that you've actually opened up your heart and you have expressed to God how great he is and you've, you've acknowledged your need for him. That's a worship experience. Everything else is Amen. essential. Everything else is essential. Walking into an auditorium, the lights are dark. There's a spotlight on the singer. He's got that pole mic clutch like it's his girlfriend. And all we get is sexual, sensual worship as if Jesus is our boyfriend. Jesus is not our boyfriend. He's, he's not really our daddy. We make him out like he's some kind of an earthly daddy that's supposed to give us ice cream when we behave well. God is holy. And in context, yes, we should teach the love of God. Because God did commend his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But the first characteristic you've got to know about the Most High is that he is holy. And if you become a Christian and you spend enough time understanding that God is holy, it will help you in your behavior as a Christian. These are things that people don't teach anymore. It's just too boring. Who wants to talk about God and his holiness and how that leads to sanctification and then how do you understand what righteousness is and how did God give us righteousness when we're undeserved and then how that equates into faithfulness and how does that equate into godly living and to loving thy neighbor? It's all one daisy chain. You can't miss any steps in the process. If you do, you become a retarded Christian. And yep. I was a retarded Christian because nobody daisy-chained all those issues together, and I was sinful, and I was lustful, and I knew better, but I couldn't do better because I was not taught correctly. And then I have all the stimulus of music cluttering and getting in the way of the truth of the gospel because I was leaning on the dopamine as a part of my quote-unquote cleansing process made me feel good and not understanding what true biblical repentance is. See, the, the, the deception that Satan does, he gives people their dopamine and an emotional experience, and they think because they have goosebumps or they tear up, that that equates to real repentance. Well, I'll just be honest and say it like this. If you ever want to get right with God, then go to God and tell him what it is that you love more than him. Start right there. And if you can start right there and get honest with him, then you're on your way to repentance, nothing less. Because everybody has at least one idol in their heart, and you've got to deal with it, and you will deal with it every day for the rest of your life. And if they tell you different, they're lying to you. Because we have to fight our flesh every single day. Now, I know I'm, I know I'm coming across heavy-handed, but these things don't get said on a Sunday a Wednesday a Sunday morning, a Sunday night. But they need to be said. Our channel exists 
to mature believers that are saying, hmm, something's not quite right. I feel like something's missing. That's why it gives us this platform to share so that they won't be victimized, Brother Kyle, Pastor Kenny, like we were. And with that, I'll yield to Kyle. Yeah, I mean, the other point I just want to emphasize is that the music in the church is just bad. I mean, just at face value, a lot of it now. So one uh, guy said one time that one of or the biggest problem in the church now is that preachers don't actually believe the book that they're reading from. And that was really powerful. And I think you can make that same equation to the music. People don't actually believe the songs they're singing. And that's why you need to have more of this artificial emotion interjected and the lights and the flashing, this and that, to compensate for the lack of conviction in the music itself. And the audience knows that. You know, if you sing a song that's truthful to you, Sean, even if you're not a good singer, and I don't know how good of a singer you are, but I'm saying let's just say you're not a very good singer and you're singing a song with conviction, even if it's not well sung from a technical standpoint, somebody listening to you would know if you believe what you're actually singing. It would be like, wow, they're really convicted about that. doesn't mean you're going to put it on a record, <laughs> but you can tell if it's honest. And I think audiences can pick up on that immediately if a song is vain or if it's empty or if it's you know, just this hollow kind of vessel of you know, repetition and you know, banal nonsense. And that's what a lot of Christian radio is. For one thing, they, for some reason, they play like the same four songs over. I mean, you could just make it like 10 songs, but they only have four, and they play like the same four songs. And it's like, they're all just like, meh, nah. Like people, you know, if you listen to that, like that, that's, that's a commercial product. And yeah. it really, really the whole construct is flawed. So, you know, when you, when you go to judge something like that, you, you want to really bring it down to the root problem, and that's that they've made music a commodity and then they've Christianized it. So when I judge it, I'm judging it all the way down to the base level and saying that it's really a flawed construct. And we talked about that in the last call, commoditizing music. But this is just a byproduct of that. Music that's repetitive, the same four songs being played over and over again. They're trying to sell it to you. They're trying to get it stuck in your head. It's a brand. You know, it's, you shouldn't have to call something Christian. It should just, if it is Christian, you just know it. So there are all sorts of problems with it, but just getting back to the main point, just to bring this uh, full circle, I think it, one of the big, big problems is that the music is not convicting, and the audience can sense that right away. And so there's a lot of compensation on the front of lights and entertainment, and they're, they're trying to pump it up to make it something to compensate for what it really isn't and what it should be, which it should be edifying, convicting music. So throw it back to, to you, Sean. Well, you said can something I, can very Can I add something in. for a second? Yeah, go right ahead, Kenny. I'll hold off. Can go ahead. Okay, and, and this is going to be real quick. Um, this is going to te uh, test on the, the vision casting leaders in the church or the vision casting type of pastors. People become an image of who their leader is. People become, their ideology becomes what their leader teaches. So when, it, when you said earlier and you made the point about the, it being boring and it's, it's reflected in the songs that we do, it's, it's reflected in the songs that we do because of what the vision leader, he, now he's saying he's gotten a vision from God. This is what God is giving him to make his church. But the thing of it is, most preachers learn the word to, just to give the word. They don't learn the word to receive the word. Amen. And that's the problem with most pastors in the church. We, learn, we, we do all this study because we want to give a word. That word needs to prick you. That word needs to chastise you. That word needs to grow you. That word needs to do everything to you. Because the whole point is the gospel. So because we are focused on the vision, or and I'm, I'm using this in quotes, the vision casting leader, and you can always tell who's close to the pastor because they actually start to look like the pastor. They dress like them. They, their, their theology, they think like them. 
So when you have a group of people that start to favor the pastor and mimic the pastor, now you understand why the, the music tends to get, the, the sermon tends to get a little boring dry because, the, number one, they don't believe that they are a new creation because they haven't received the word. They gave the word. And number two, the word is not water in them springing up to everlasting life. Good God Almighty. The word is not water. See, the thing about me now, now that I'm understanding the Bible, that I, the way that I'm understanding the Bible now, which is a lot more to learn and I'll ever be learning, is, again, the bigger Jesus gets, the smaller my vision gets. Amen. That, that, yeah, I've said that before, and I'll say it again. The bigger he gets, the smaller I get. And the word literally becomes water because I truly believe I am a new creation in Christ Jesus and Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, is molding me. So a lot of these people may need to do some, some, some examining of themselves and think about, do I still need to be under this vision-casting pastor? Or do I need to find myself a Bible-believing, a Bible-teaching church that will focus on the word more than the talent? Because we yeah, well, I got to add to that. More than the I got something to add to that. So, Sean, you, Sean, you talked about you know, repetition and music, and it shouldn't be part of the music that's not part of our prayers. And, Kenny, what you just said, you talked about, and I'm going to reflect right against what you just said there. So music, why repeat the same line over and over when you can add a new line in that music? I mean, there's so much in the Bible to sing about, guys, and it, we shouldn't have songs that repeat the same phrase four times in a song. You should – some of the, the best gospel music – actually puts in scriptures throughout the whole song. So you've got all this room to work with. I mean, you tell me that you can't find enough material to, have, to keep it fresh. You've got to repeat the same line within the same song multiple times. So it really is about becoming more scriptural in the actual writing process of the music. So I just want to make that point. Well, you guys are really on fire right now. I've, I've, I've been having then, notes for weeks just to kind of bring this together, and I think I can bring both what both of y'all just said together. So I'm going to start with you, Brother Kenny. Everything you said as a, from a pastor's standpoint, as a brother in the Lord, became, is very important because people cannot mimic or should not mimic their pastors. They should follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said. So that means that it is perfectly okay for every Christian to become a Berean. Search the scriptures daily to see if these things are true, Acts 17.11. That's the, the base scripture for this channel. Hey, let's be Bereans. We're not saying that you're wrong, but we're going to check it out. Cross-check and exactly. verify, as they say on the airlines. So I had a comment a day ago from uh, a video we did some long, a while ago called Zeal, but not according to knowledge. And this, con this listener, viewer, said this. I'm going to read this because it's telling. Then I'm going to be able to get to Kyle's point. Um, I believe it's she. She says, I'm an active member of a church where preaching, the Bible, where preaching and Bible study is so out of context. It is all about power, prosperity, and authority, and disregard knowledge of Scripture. They said experience is above all important. And I said to myself, what experience are they seeking? Back to the dopamine effect. Then she says, I'm deeply grieved, and I decided to leave that church. Last Sunday is my last with them. They decreed and declared Deuteronomy 28 last Sunday, which was January the 2nd this year, for themselves. She says, I nearly cried for how can we be so ignorant? I went home after service to study Deuteronomy 28 and, and all the way through chapter 30, and it grieved me even more. She says, I love your videos. Can you please do, quote, the believer's authority, because I have disagreed with them, and they have said that I have a spirit of pride. Thanks, brother, for all that you do. This is a huge blessing. So now I'm going to read how I replied to her because that was an interesting comment. So I said, hello, I am Precioso. Just reading what you 
experience sadness. So many pastors teach Deuteronomy 18 out of context. This passage of Scripture cannot be applied to New Testament saints. In fact, the only people this was applicable for was Jews who came out of Egypt and those who actually crossed over the Jordan. This was a specific mandate for a specific people at a specific time. Not everything in the Old Testament can be applied to New Testament Christians. It is interesting, the Torah, the books of the law, tells us not to commit adultery. Then in the New Testament, Jesus tells us to not even think about it. So which is harder, commandments to keep the old or what Jesus said in his Gospels? What Jesus said in the Gospels and his letters in Revelation are the most valuable things we need to live by, but most pastors are too busy manipulating people for a tithe, which also does not apply to New Testament Christians, another story for another time. Don't let this get you down. Consider yourself blessed that God will pull you away from heretical teaching. As the days draw close, there are a lot of things we need to walk away from and teachings that need to be unlearned. We are still unlearning so much biblical doctrinal error. It is a journey, and we are glad you are on the road with us. And, yes, we will do a video on the believer's authority. It is not as expansive as most false teachers proclaim. In fact, once you understand it, you will appreciate Jesus and the work he's still doing as our high priest before God all the more. God bless you. So I wanted to share that because what you said Pastor Kenny, is so important. If we have people who are pulled in by music and then they are basically completely demolished and destroyed because the pastor has not made the focus on Christ, then they have done everybody a disservice. So I'm going to keep being long-winded, and I'm going to shift over to what Kyle said. So, Kyle, you said there's a lot of pastors and musicians that they don't even believe what they preach and they don't believe what they sing. Well, in some of my research and getting ready for this call, I was completely disheartened because I Googled the phrase, people who have renounced their faith. And primarily, this happens to a lot of musicians. And to your point, Kyle, they renounce their faith because they never had faith. Now, a prominent song of song leader, some gentleman by the name of Marty Sampson, I don't know his music, but he is with or was with Hillsong, recently made three statements that are quite telling. And to your point, Kyle, when you talked about people not believing what they're preaching and not believing what they're saying, here's a perfect example of this. And this is not my words. These are his words. These are the words of Marty Sampson, former singer at Hillsong, he says, because he has renounced his faith, quote, my songs are as shallow as my faith church life, Marty Sampson Hillsong, worship leader and songwriter, has confessed the real reason behind the lack of depth in his songs. Quote, I just don't have any real faith in Jesus, bloke, he's Australian, but I can write a good love song with the best of them. And that has been the secret to my success. So I'm going to stop right there because there's more. But I just need to say that is our problem right there. People who are proclaiming that they're children of God, singing spiritual songs that are not theologically sound, and they have become the pie piper of a generation, and these people are going headlong over the waterfall and headlong off a cliff. If you haven't heard anything that we've said today, listener, music is a weapon, and it can destroy you, and it could wreck your faith if it doesn't proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that, and I yield to Pastor Kenny. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for your, your points, all of them. Um, one thing that you said that I, I really do want to um, kind of go back on is making um, music becoming an idol. Because I really don't think we understand the seriousness of that statement that you made. We gotta understand that music can very, very quickly become an idol, and I'm gonna show you how. Like I told you before in the in the last uh, podcast, I've been a musician on the secular side and in the church side, 
and how when you look at the movement of the people, a lot of times you can't tell the difference from the church to the, the, the club. With that being said, Pastor Kenny, I went really long there, but I do want to give you, I'll give you the last word on everything we've shared in that respect. Everything that you shared, Brother Sean and, and Brother Kyle, was spot on. This is what I will add to it. Um, John says in 1 John 2, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain, become plain that they all are not of us. When anybody talks, because I've seen that too, pastors re- renouncing their faith. You never had faith in the beginning. Because Jesus makes it perfectly clear, and I'm going to sum it up with this. Jesus makes it perfectly clear in Matthew and in Luke, uh, Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his right. cross daily and follow me. The first thing you need to do is die to yourself. Mm-hmm. So we live in a, in, a, in a social media age, a music-driven age, a, a me, myself, and I age that we don't want to die to self until we understand that the music is, whatever kind of music you do without no words is just neutral. But when you add sinful people to that mix and our hearts not following after Christ, that music becomes something that is so damaging. You gave a litmus test earlier. I'm going to give you one more. Look at your favorite artists from when they started doing music and look at them as they came up, like your Kirk Franklin's, your um, Hezekiah Walker's, your John P. Keys. Look at them as they come up through their music. See if their music is still theologically sound. That's correct. See if the words, That's right. like get into the words of it. See if it's theologically sound. <laughs> then go to your church and really be the Berean. Look at what's going on. If it does not line up with the word of God, get on your two feet and run as fast as you can to a Bible-believing church. I promise you it will not be as boring as you think it is because as soon as you think it's boring, you're in yourself anyway. Pride. I yield the floor. Pastor Ken, you just said it best, and here we are again, not exhausting the topic, so we are going to come back for a third part for a wrap-up. Brother Kyle had to jump off the call because we didn't know we were going to go this long, but I want to thank him because I know he'll listen back to this. I want to thank you, and I want to thank the audience for hanging in here with this content. You know, both Pastor Kenny and Brother Kyle and I, um, we're just a bunch of no-names with the Bible. However, we've had enough experience and enough failure to understand to avoid the, the pitfalls And music has become a weapon of choice against those who could walk in the precepts of God and walk in righteousness according to the word. But they've made an idol of it. They are unwilling, or people are simply unwilling, to let go of things. It was a hard, hard road when the Lord finally got me back in 2016 and 17 to let go of ministry, to let go of the, theolog- uh, the theology, to let go of individuals, pastors that I had been following, and said, okay, Sean, why don't you read the Gospels all over, uh, all over again and ask yourself the question, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I believe Jesus should forgive my sins? So you and I, are always responsible for our spiritual growth. There won't be a worship leader singing, standing there before you, with you, along with the Lord. None of that's going to happen. So what we're saying is it is perfectly okay to be in an, an offensive mode, looking for Christ, and in a defensive mode, standing against the darkness. God told us to resist Satan, and he would flee from him. He would flee from us. And music 
is one of the tools that we need to resist. I know this sounds odd. I know this sounds crazy. But most of what's called Christian music is a weapon of choice of the enemy. We can't persuade you, and we're not here to try to change your mind. We're simply asking you to go to the Lord in prayer and consider what we're saying and give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to be the arbiter of truth. So we have gone long today. Pastor Kenny, thank you so much for being with us. We'll come back for part, part three. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Brother Sean. Thank you so much. All right, and we'll leave it right there. So thank you for listening to this installment of Point Counterpoint. We will wrap up probably with a part three next week. And as always, we pray that God will bless you and God bless you and your families.